One of my favorite hymns is a very, very old-fashioned one. We sang it here once, right after we first started. But that's over three years ago now, and I think it's probably time to revisit the hymn. The hymn is called, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Whenever she saw that on the, uh, the newsletter, and if you don't get the newsletter, just send an email to info at rsafeharbor.com, and we'll send you the, the newsletter. It's just a once-a-week thing. Uh, Sharon Fields up in Indiana, one of our dear members, sent me a long story. I almost read it, Sharon, but I hadn't had a chance to get in touch with you to see if that was all right, so I didn't. But a long story about an older woman who kind of took her in and helped her learn church and helped her learn how to be a part of church and how she had used that hymn to teach them how to sing and sing in harmony. And that she and, and some other girls were trained by this woman. And then they were able to get up on a Sunday and sing their song with their, that, that grandmotherly-like figure beaming from the front pew. Hymns bring back memories and ideas. And just like songs do, people have their song. And sometimes you hear a song and it takes you back to a certain place in your life. I always kid and say that somebody asked Cammie what song did she think of every time she thought of meeting me, and she said, if I had a hammer. Not true, <laughs> not true, but still fun to think about. You know, um, let's talk about lighthouses, and let's talk about the lower lights and what that means. This actually hymn was written by Philip Bliss, who wrote a lot of songs. He was a professional full-time songwriter for uh, the Moody Institute and for Charles Moody himself and all of that big hymn and, and evangelism explosion that took place uh, out of Chicago. There was a ship that was coming uh, from the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are very rocky, and, and people don't realize that the Great Lakes are also weather makers. Uh, some of uh, Americans, and especially Canadians, because he was Canadian, Gordon Lightfoot's song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, it is the, the Great Lakes is littered with shipwrecks because of sudden weather and also because of rocks. So many rocks <laughs> under the surface. And Philip Bliss was talking to Dwight Moody. I said Charles a while ago. Dwight Moody about a ship in Cleveland that was trying to get into Cleveland during a storm. And the captain was looking for the lower lights because they could not see the upper lights because of the storm. The, uh, the radio operator was saying, we don't know why, but we cannot see the lower lights. What, do you do? what can we do? And he said, we've got to get into harbor. We will die in a storm. Well, unfortunately, trying to get in without the lower lights, they hit the rocks and 200 people perished. Dwight Moody asked Philip Bliss to write a hymn referencing that incident. So when we sing that song later today, you're singing a song that comes from a true story of lower lights. In many places in the world, where we're sitting right now, we're sitting in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is in middle Tennessee. We are a long way from water. They have lakes, but we don't need lighthouses on lakes, not the size that they've got here. But if you live by the sea, if you live on an island nation like the United Kingdom or, or Greenland or any of those, lighthouses are very important. Now, lighthouses are not there to shine a light to show you the way forward. Lighthouses are there for a couple of reasons. The high light, which is everybody thinks of the higher light, the one at the top, that has a certain pulse to it, a certain little staccato pulse. And all of the nautical charts will tell you this pulse means we are off this rock. This pulse tells us we are off this area. But it also will, it's just a little warning, you, this is where you are. Be careful. The problem is, in many times, in many places, the weather comes down low. And the fog rolls in. In Western Europe, in particular in the Northern, Ireland, uh, Northern Islands, like Scotland and the Hebrides and such, this low fog rolls in. And it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. It really is. 
Uh, it gives some people the shivers, but I've always enjoyed it. It's normally known by a Norse word called har, H-A-A-R. When it, come, it looks like it's coming across the ground. And when it hits, you're socked in. And the higher light is not going to help you. Well, God is a higher light. We know that. John chapter 1 leaps into the whole idea between light and darkness and this great battle between the two. God's light, we're told in Romans 1, everybody can see it. That everyone can know about God by the things that he created. That we can look at creation and we know there is a God. And we're even told in the Psalms that it is a fool that says there is no God. Because of what we can see. God is also our light to show us our way. He's also our light to show us position. Which remember is the main purpose of the high light on a, on a lighthouse. That question that he asked early on. Where are you? To Adam and Eve. He knew where they were geographically. But they didn't know where they were spiritually. They needed that where are you now? What has happened to you? You're separate from God. Where are you? God lets us know where we are by that light. But what happens to people who don't know God or whose light has been dimmed or shut out by the weather in their life? And it could be tragedy. It could be divorce. It could be death. It could be illness. It could be whatever you want to lay on the table. It could be wars and rumors of wars, whatever it is. They feel trapped, and they do not see the higher light. Well, people in coastal areas were used to being alerted to go out to the beaches and set bonfires. You see, originally, bonfires on beaches weren't for partying, weren't for college kids and, and for drinking and the like. No, they were set there to alert ships, this is the shore. And yes, there were some bad people that would set fires to try to lure ships into a reef and then smuggle, but we're not talking about the 1% here. The people were called out, bring your lanterns, bring your lights, stand on the shores. There's a ship in trouble at the sea. I've never experienced that level of fog and terror at sea. We lived in West Virginia, another landbound area for 10 years, and it was a wonderful experience. But a few times on the mountain in which we lived, you gained 1,100 feet in the last three miles to our house. It was switchbacks, your ears would pop twice. We would even send maps to people and say, your ears will pop at this curve. And, and, and they would go, how did you know? And they say, well, we're so high, we can talk to Jesus a little easier than you. And, and it was, it was you know, Jesus comes back, we'll get a five minutes heads up. We, we had several jokes, but when the fog hit, that was terrifying. I have never been in fog like that and trying to get up that hill. They would call it a mountain, but I'm married to a lady from the Rocky Mountains, so I have to call it a hill. I have never in my life had to open the door and look down to try to find the center line and drive by that at a crawl pace, hoping nobody else is coming the other way. Whenever those nights would hit, and there were only a few in the 10 years, <laughs> telephones would ring up and down the mountain, turn on your outside lights. Everybody turn on your lights. People are on the roads they can't see. And when they did, it made all the difference. When you saw the lights, you knew that's a yard, not a road. I should be over here. And it was super helpful. It, it led people to light. But the lights on the poles, we couldn't see. We needed the lower lights. When we built our Safe Harbor Church, it was a community, not a building, not a place. And still, that's the way it's going to be. I was asked by house groups as I came across, they said, will you ever get to the point where you want to build a building? And I said, no, no. We're building communities worldwide. We're building faith in families. We're building house churches. We're, how, why would we build a building? How could we compete with somebody that has a $50 million budget for a building? How could we? Why would we? In fact, one minister who asked me that, I said, coming to your office today, 
I passed by the offices of five other ministers. And you have to spend most of your time managing ministers, don't you? And he goes, yeah, that's... And I said, I don't want to do that. I just want to talk about Jesus. And I want to spread that. And he was jealous. So I rubbed it in. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. He's, a, he's an excellent man, a wonderful man. But we want to build a community where we touch people with the love of God. Now, that's what the word kindness means. Goodness is a completely different word. Let us say that there's a charity that is taking care of people in a, um, well, let's just say in a tornado-ravaged Midwest. And I, I sacrifice. My wife and I, we look at our finances. We say, this is going to be a real stretch. This may put us in a bind, but we're going to write a check for this amount and send it to this particular church or charitable organization. That's good. That's good, and people should do good things. But kindness is different. Kindness is different in its arc. You are being good to people of your kind, which literally meant within your reach. So now I'm being good to this person right here. Not to nameless people I've written a check to, but I'm being kind to a person who is right in front of me. My kind, as English would also say, your kind are your people, the people around you. I had one person say that they were in an area and they looked around and they said, I realize these are not my people. And I said, yes, they were. If you were there, they're your people. When you walked in that shop or that mechanics area or whatever, you now have new people. And those are your kind. Will there be kindness? Well, that's up to us. We love and respect uh, search and rescue team members. Firefighters, police, military, others who put their lives on the line for the rest of us. We see them place themselves in harm's way, sometimes knowing that they're going to be hurt or killed, but they do it anyway. And we're stunned by this, and we honor them. Special license plates, holidays, privileges, maybe even discounts. But I think we look up to them because at some level we want to be them. You never see a little kid say, when I grow up, I want to be somebody who watches firefighters or policemen or nurses or doctors. No, they want to be. They want to be those people. But then we grow up and we forget. And we do other things. Churches are the same. They start off well. But they forget that they're, they're called to be heroes. They're called to be lower lights that reach the people the up, that are not being reached by the upper light. We forget. Now, if you've ever owned a boat, first of all, my commiserations, boats are wonderful, fantastic things until you let them touch water. And then they are a self-destroying hole in the water into which you pour money. And if you have a boat and you love boats and you're willing to do that, great, but you already know Every so often, either you got to pull that water, the boat out of the water or you got to pay divers to go down and scrape the boat. And if you live in some places that are warm and uh, let's just say full of life, like Florida or the Caribbean, that's going to have to happen every few months. Scrape the boat. Why? Because after a while, it's not a boat anymore. It's just a big block of stuff you're trying to shove through the water. You've got to clean it up. And our safe harbor is bound and determined to remember who we are and to keep it lean and keep it moving forward and not forget who we're supposed to be. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, God has sent in rescue teams. They were not born heroes, or, and we wouldn't have picked most of them, honestly. If you ever read the, New Test uh, the Old Testament in particular, would you have picked these people? We would not have expected them. But we got Noah, world's worst carpenter. Took him 100 years to build a large box, but, and the world's worst preacher. After 100 years of preaching, the only people that got on were his family. Nobody would have hired Noah, but God did. What about Melchizedek? Strange, came out of nowhere. The prophets, the kings, the judges. I remember when I was a little boy reading all the, the stories and being told all the stories about the wonderful King David, and then I read Chronicles. 
and kings. And I went, oh boy, I wouldn't have picked this guy and I wouldn't have trusted him to look after my dog. But God picked him and he was a man after God's own heart, which tells me something about me, but it also tells me a lot more about God. And finally, in the fullness of time, he sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. We didn't see Jesus coming either. And what did Jesus do? Rescue missions. The woman at the well, thrown away by a long series of men, but not by God. Zacchaeus. That's the other end of the spectrum. She was looked upon as super sinful of no value. He was looked upon super powerful. You better watch out for him because he's got all the power. Zacchaeus, he needed rescue too. How about Matthew? Matthew himself was a tax collector. And Jesus picked him to be part of a group that already had a couple zealots in it. Who are zealots? I hear you cry. Oh, that's simple. Zealots were people who were politically committed to killing people like Matthew. And Jesus puts them all in one little group, says, get along, <laughs> sleep well. <laughs> I don't think Matthew slept well for a while. I don't, I don't think whenever James and John were over there going, we'll take first watch, go ahead. <laughs> Nighty night. I don't think it went well, but Jesus rescued him. He also rescued James and John and those in a violent cult of the, of the zealots. He rescued Saul, first known as Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus, now known to us as the Apostle Paul. How about the widow at the gates? A very simple, short story. Luke 7, 12, but in and out. She had nothing. She had lost her only son. She was condemned to a life of poverty and ignominy, but Jesus just immediately restored her son and her life. What about the woman with the, uh, the bleeding issue in Mark chapter 5? Jesus is searching and rescue, searching and rescue, searching and rescue. That's his life. And he turns and looks at us and says, follow me. So we build buildings and tell everybody, we've got to make you conform and say what we say, believe what we say, and do the rituals we do, and maybe you'll get saved. And I'm going, what happened? Our ship of faith got a lot of barnacles on it, and nobody cleaned it. Nobody went back to what are we here for? And of course, Jesus' mission culminated with salvation offered to all, but only after he had sacrificed himself. I love Hebrews so much. People ask about stranded island, what would you take? And I always say, I would take the gospel of John, I would take the Psalms, and I would take Hebrews. Hebrews to remind me who Jesus is, gospel of John, because it's the most beautiful gospel, to, in my opinion, and the Psalms, because no matter what attitude I've got that day, there's a Psalm for it. But Psalm, uh, Hebrews 7, verses 24 through 27. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Yeah. And then... Moving on, just chapter 10, verse 10. One verse here. And by that will, his will, we have been made... Pay attention to the tense of the phrase. We have been made holy. Not you might be holy one day if you're good enough and conform to the rules and regulations of this particular <laughs> denominator. No, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Metaphysically, Jesus ran into a building that was coming apart. He ran into a building on fire. He ran into a building where everybody else was running out of. The ultimate hero. And while we certainly honor him for his teachings and for his pure life, what makes us bow down before Jesus is his selfless, loving, giving act. For on the cross, Jesus went from rabbi to rescuer. And that made all the difference. A short story. 
And again, you cannot mention anything without people thinking there's a political background. No, this is purely history. Muslims had started slave trades, and, and in fact, they're still the main slave traders on the planet. But back in this particular time, they hara were harassing anybody who merely wanted to cross the Atlantic to see their families or to make a new life. They had uh, also been swarming through the Mediterranean. And as the book White Gold lays out in very detailed historical uh, precision, they were running slave trades out of northern Africa. And it was disrupting shipping. It was disrupting life. The year was 1775. The president realized, uh, the, uh, you know, the early Americas uh, understood as soon as they became independent, something had to be done. But they didn't have anybody that could go over there and do it. So the president wrote a letter to be read in bars. And he walked, the first reader walked into Tun's Tavern outside of Philadelphia and started the end of the slave trade that was plaguing the Americas. By the way, before then, the government just kept paying the Muslims money, saying, if we pay you money, will you leave us alone? That didn't help. So something had to be happen, ha had to happen, and into Tun's Tavern walked a man, opened a letter and said, we are looking for a few good men. And that was a birthday at the United States Marine Corps. Years later, they launched their attack on the Barbary pilots. Their song even today, from the shores of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, northern Africa. They launched their attack. Eight Marines, eight Marines led 200 mercenaries they had trained in the desert and captured the fortress city of Dima. And in a sign of respect for their toughness and tenacity, a nearby Turkish sultan gave them the Mameluk sword, which to this day, Marines stand tall in their dress blues and carry that sword. The pirates' backs were broken. Slaves were freed, not by superheroes, but by men who stood up and said, here I am, send me. That's the same thing Isaiah said, but not to break the backs of slavery as we saw in North Africa, but rather slavery from sin, from not being able to see the light of God that said, I will be the light. Isaiah said, here am I. Whenever the call of heaven went out, who will we send? Who will go for us? He said, here I am, send me. This is fundamentally different from the bulk of most humanity. Think about it. Most church members, and I know I'm being slanderous here, but I do believe I'm actually being correct more than slanderous. Most church members cry out, here I am, cater to me. Here I am, comfort me. Here I am, confirm me in my already held beliefs. What would it be like if we volunteered to go wherever Jesus wanted us to go and be whatever he wanted us to be? I mean, God has always looked for volunteers, but if he doesn't find them, I, let me warn you, he is not adverse to tapping on shoulders. I've made it very plain. I don't feel like I volunteered to do any of the work I've done through my life. I think, you know, most people have a really good ditch story, I call it. You know, I woke up, I was in a ditch, I realized I had fallen so low, I wanted to get out of my ditch. I loved my ditch. It was a great ditch. God kept pulling me out of the ditch. God kept pushing me forward, and I kept saying, I'm the wrong man, I'm not trained for this, I have the wrong life, I'm not the person you need, and God just it continued to ignore me. He will do the same for you if you don't volunteer he might volunteer you and said, come on, let's go. God is still watching us as we go to the work, to the shops, to events. Even as we walk around the neighborhood, he's watching to see if we'll set out the lower lights. What are the lower lights? Kindness, grace, peace, love, joy. Look at the fruits of the spirit. Recently, we had our, our yard mulch because I don't mulch. I can, but my wife has something called standards, so I don't mulch. 
but we had it mulched, and she's made plantings there and such, and it, and it looks really good, and the neighbors like it, but what we really need to be growing in our garden is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, you, all of that. The fruits of the spirits is found in, in the New Testament, and we, we know them. We just need to set out the lower lights. So wherever we are, whoever's in front of us, we treat them with amazing respect and dignity and kindness, even if they disagree with us, even if they're disagreeable. For Jesus did tell us to love everybody, and frankly, some people make it harder than it's necessary to make it. And sometimes it's us. So we love them anyway. There are creative ways of doing this, and I could, I could literally be here for the next several hours just brainstorming those. But one of the ones that really hit me was one I'd never thought of before as a way to set out the lower lights. I was speaking for the Texas State Forensic um, Technicians, their big conference. And we had a meal, and at the meal at my table sat a lady and another couple, and this couple was, had, uh, the, they had met me at registration and had kind of shepherded me through things. And they said, you need to know this lady. And I looked over, it's a very unassuming lady, uh, probably a few years older than me. And I said, what do I need to know about you? And she just said nothing. But then they told me, she's single, and she has spent the last, I don't know, decades, she goes to the, the pound or the animal shelter, whatever you want to call it, and finds the oldest, sickest dog. And she takes it home. And she loves on it, and she makes sure its last weeks or months are filled with love and care. When it dies, she comes back. Now, you might think, what does that have to do with church? <clears throat> kindness has to do with everything and her example humbled me at the table her example I bet has humbled a lot of folk but not shamed no not shamed humbled means wow I should be doing things like this now I can't do the dog thing because my way of life would be actually causing the, the dog more problems because I'm not there but I can find ways to be kind to people that nobody else wants to be kind to. I can find ways that get hate mail. You don't return hate. Instead, you say, how can I love you better? What's the best thing I can do for you? The Bible says by doing this, you can heap coals of fire on people's heads. That's not why we do it. We do it to be more like Jesus. Dream with me. What would it be like to hear the commission from the lips of Jesus? Go into all the world and teach them to do the things I've taught you to do. Then look at Jesus' life. Didn't look like building a church and demanding conformity and stamping out little cookie cutter Christians. What did Jesus do? He searched and rescued those that the others would not talk to, including the hyper-religious arrogant ones. Sometimes we always think of the ones that churches have hurt you know, these people that think they know everything are hurting too. And maybe they're harder to love, but that's their job. I think our safe harbor is uniquely set to live out this commission. But it's going to require each of us to create community just by love. Just by the way we treat each other. Not door-to-door -door evangelism. Remember door-to-door -door evangelism? People don't do that anymore. Or they shouldn't. It used to be somebody knocked on the door. Everybody ran to see who it was. We don't do that anymore. We have doorbells to tell us who's there. And act like we're not home. We do the same with our phones. I can remember my, my dad used to make us go put the papers through the doors. Or talk to people about our church having a meeting. And I, I can remember one time we were on our own. My dad and I. And he said, you take that street. I'll take this street. And uh, talk to people. If you're not there, put the papers through the door. Well, because you in Scotland and, and Britain, they have a mail slot. You, you push through the door. So I didn't knock on doors. You know, I, I kind of rub them a little. <laughs> yeah, don't think they're home. 
And I remember one time I was actually bent down shoving the papers through the door when the lady opened the door. And I froze. She said, can I help you? I said, hi. If you just shut the door. Um, Now, my dad's passed now, so I can tell that story. But my point is, I don't know how many people we actually reached that way, but we might have reached a lot back in the day where that was more acceptable. I think now we reach them with love and service. We're the first to greet. We're the last to turn away. It could be prayer teams. It could be men and women's classes. It could be sharing our videos with the other people. It can be, as we have, made this copyright free. So there are churches out there that were dying, couldn't afford ministries, and now they use our videos, and we're happy for it. We haven't asked for a penny, and we won't. House churches, clusters. Let's, somehow let's move away from self-centered Christianity and truly blossom into the mission-oriented church that follows our selfless, giving, loving steps of Jesus, the Messiah, and our Savior. So we stand here today looking at our Messiah. He's looking at us, and he's asking for volunteers. He'll keep his higher light burning, for he is light. But we're called to man the lower lights. This will not be easy. It will require laying aside our fears, and here's a big one, renouncing our comfort and risking ourselves on something larger, far more important than our lives. I want to tell a story and then we'll sing a short hymn and be done. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occurred, there was once a crude little life-saving station, a hut, really, There was only one boat, and with no thought for themselves, a few tireless volunteers spent day and night searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the community thought this was a wonderful thing, and they wanted to become associated with that little station. And so they gave of their time, and they gave of their money, and they gave of their effort for the support of this really important work. New boats were bought. New crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for people rescued from the sea. They placed the emergency cots with beds, and they, they said, no, let's get better furniture. Let's enlarge the building. And now the life-saving station had gone from hut to really a a nice gathering place, a popular gathering place for its members. And they, they decorated it beautifully because it had become somewhat of a club, maybe a status symbol. Fewer members were actually interested in actually getting out in the boats in the sea. They were, um, they, they hired lifeboat crews to do that for them now. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's songs, decorations. There's even kind of a liturgical lifeboat room in the room where the club's initiations were held. And about this time, another large ship wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boatloads of all kinds of people, cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. The beautiful new clubhouse was in chaos. So the proper property committee decided we need to build a shower unit outside the, the, the club where victims of shipwrecks can be cleaned up before they come inside. At the next meeting, there was a split among the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the life-saving activities because they were unpleasant and they're a hindrance to the normal social life of the life-saving club. Some members insisted on still life-saving as a core part of their work. They pointed out they're still called a life-saving station. But they were voted down, and they were told, if you want to do that kind of thing, there's Long Beach down there. You can go down and do your own. So they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old one. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station had to be founded. 
history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs all along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. I think the lesson is obvious. We must be who God called us to be. And at the cost of our own comfort, we have to be the lower lights.